In September 1905, a group of mandarins paraded majestically into the Forbidden City. They were there to present themselves to the Emperor Guangxu and the Empress Dowager Sashi. The group had assembled with one solemn purpose, to decide the fate of the system that for over 1,300 years had been the bedrock of the empire's civil administration. <laughs> Educational reform has been an issue in China for decades if not centuries. Finally, in the late Qing Dynasty, things began to change. A decision was taken in 1901 as China's failing relations with the rest of the world illustrated the nation's weakness to change to a modern Western-style schooling system within 10 years. Progress, however, was slow. The attachment of the scholar gentry to the old system had always raised the prospect of serious resistance to any change. They simply had too much invested in the old system and too much to lose. But now, in 1905, the situation could book no further delay. The emperor and the empress dowager sat in judgment. The imperial examination system is sometimes called the fifth great invention of China, after the compass, gunpowder, paper making, and printing. For centuries, it served to select the men capable of holding the vast empire together and to bond the educated in a common purpose. But now, it had come to be seen more as a straitjacket than a support. The question was, could China survive without it? essence of the imperial examination system meant that it always had been seen as a ladder for social mobility. To qualify at any level was an achievement, and to qualify at the highest levels could bring honor, glory, and riches for generations. By the 19th century, the limitations of the Confucian study system were becoming ever more apparent.
In the fall of 1863, leading statesman and general Zheng Gorfan received a visitor. Zheng was a gentry scholar who had taken up arms to defend the empire from the Taiping rebels. Now on the brink of victory, he was the most powerful man in the country. His visitor was one Rong Hong, the first Chinese man to be educated in the West. Rong Hong, who was born in Oman, in a single family of the Guangdong people, in the early years, the Prussian government was born in the first time, which was the first time. At 18 years old, 随外籍教师奉美，日耶鲁大学深造，成为中国第一位留学西洋的留学生。After his graduation in 1854, Rong Hong returned to China. He returned to a country much of which was devastated by a war that had killed 20 million people. Rong Hong dreamed of contributing to the rebuilding of the nation. But in 1863, with the Taiping rebels contained, but still dangerous, Zhang Gorfan needed access to Western manufacturing technologies to support the government's arsenals. Zheng commissioned Rong to go back abroad and buy the necessary machinery. In fact, Rong Hong had been hoping for Zheng's backing in asking the court to send Chinese students abroad to study Western science and technology. But he realized this would be seen as controversial by many traditional scholars. So he decided to bide his time. Seven years later, Rong got his chance. And one year after that, on August the 5th, 1871, Zheng and another official, Li Hong Jiang, jointly proposed to the court that Chinese students be sent to study in the West. Within the month, their suggestion was approved. Millions and millions of hours of scholarship have been dedicated to pursuit of perfection within the imperial examination system. For a country whose culture has reigned supreme across East Asia for 2,000 years, this was a huge step. Yitang 
the British sent an embassy to China, hoping to establish trade relations. However, the imperial government, under the aged emperor, Qianlong, rebuffed them. The emperor told the British, we possess all things. I see no value on objects strange or ingenious and have no use for your country's manufactures. In fact, in the late 18th century, there was a huge trade imbalance in China's favor, which the British sought to even up by selling opium grown in India. But when the governor of Canton destroyed British-owned opium stocks in 1839 and then refused to pay compensation, the British sent a fleet to enforce their commercial rights. The brief war left China humiliated and forced to open its ports under the first of a series of unequal treaties. Military defeat came as a profound shock to the Qing. Gradually, there was an awakening to just how far China had fallen behind the rest of the world in science and technology. It was a problem the traditional Confucian education system could only exacerbate. Zheng and Li's petition to the emperor was a recognition that the problem could no longer be ignored. Many scholars had joined China's self-strengthening movement in the 1860s and 70s to achieve economic and military modernization. While foreigners could be hired to bring in some of the necessary knowledge, conservatives in government were always suspicious of them and unwilling to let them act freely. The only option was for Chinese to be sent overseas to study in foreign universities, as Rong Hong had envisioned. Supported by Li Hong Jiang in 1871, the Chinese Educational Mission selected 120 students to study abroad. Those selected had received some traditional Chinese education, but all were eager to imbibe the promised new learning. On August 11, 1872, notwithstanding the scorn of the nation's many chauvinists, the first group of 30 students, all aged 12, boarded ship for San Francisco. The plan was for them to study in the United States for 15 years. Yang Fai, although,虽然意识到中国需要向西方学习，但毕竟这些西欧层面，在中期西欧的框架内，并未动摇传统教育的根据。但无论如何，又从留美计划尼布的科技培养人才的不足，也说明科技启示的合理性。In March 1895, a group of men from Nanhai in Guangdong arrived in the capital for the imperial examination. Among them was Kung Yo Wei. Born in 1858, Kung had long chafed at the limitations of the imperial exam system. reformist petition he had submitted to the court. In 1891, he had founded a school run on modern principles in Guangdong. Few of his proposals reached the emperor, killed off quietly by conservative officials, to whom Kung was a dangerous radical. 
1895, he arrived in the capital with his student Liang Chi Chao, intending them both to sit the Metropolitan Examination. The chief examiner that year was a royal scholar and academician called Xu Tong. Xu had seen some of Kung's earlier proposals and had called Kung a madman. Xu was determined to fail Kung, come what may. However, since the identities of the examinees were hidden, he couldn't tell which was Kung's paper. Xu told his assistants, if there were any outstanding papers written by candidates from Guangdong, fail them. They found one such outstanding paper and failed it with a mocking quotation from a famous love poem. My tears wet the pearls, I have to return to you. What a shame I'm not available. Xu would have even been less amused when Kung Yo Wei celebrated his past by flying a special banner outside his family home. However, as Kung was celebrating, China's ruling class were reeling from yet another military failure, a comprehensive defeat by Japan in the First Sino-Japanese War. The 1894-95 war made it seem that the 30 years of effort under the self-strengthening movement had all been in vain. The modern Bay Young fleet had been defeated easily. Even foreign observers were surprised at the failure. The Treaty of Shimonoseki ceded both Taiwan and the Liaodong Peninsula to Japan. It further stipulated that China had to pay Japan 200 million silver tiles in compensation and abandon its influence in Korea. Elder statesman Li Hong Jiang, who had long warned of Japanese expansionism, had to be called on once again to try to make the best of the situation. Japan was represented by its prime minister, Ito Hirobumi, a key figure in both Japan's reform and its expansionism. Lee was even shot and seriously wounded by a Japanese nationalist during the negotiations. People 康一伟和弟子梁启超联合国神举人发动生死浩大的工具上书他在工具上书请变通科举之中第一次尖锐地揭露了八股趋势对人才的戕害对国家的危害 In April 1898, Kung Youwei petitioned the emperor again. This time, Guangxu took notes, and Kung and his colleagues were appointed to advise the emperor.
Thus began the event known as the Hundred Days Reforms. The first edict was published on June 11th of that same year. On June 23rd, a decree was issued abolishing the eight-legged essay as the examination answer format. Fangian,Sendio But going shoes across the board reforms proved too much, too fast for the conservative factions of the government and the Manchu aristocracy. The abolition of sinecures, the proposal for constitutional monarchy, the emphasis on science, technology and commerce all threatened many vested interests. Reactionaries looked to the Empress Dowager Sashi, for so long the power behind the throne, to resist her nephew. On September 21st, 1898, Sashi struck. The Emperor was placed in protective detention on Yingtai Island within the grounds of the royal palace. The six main reform leaders were arrested and executed. After her successful coup, the Empress Dowager resumed the regency she began when she had placed her three-year-old nephew on the throne in 1875. She also resumed the old style of imperial examination. On the morning of August 15, 1900, Empress Dowager was at her toilet in the Forbidden City when a bullet flew through a window. Then a member of the Imperial household rushed in to warn her that the foreign soldiers were on their way to the palace. Outside the palace walls, all was chaos as troops from the Eight Nation Alliance, who had the day before fought their way into the city to relieve the siege of the foreigners in the legation district, cleared the streets. The Empress decided to flee. The Empress Dowager had discreetly encouraged the anti-foreigner violence of the Boxer movement in North China. Now things had got out of control, and foreign troops arrived to restore order. Some elements of the Manchu aristocracy had supported the boxers in an attempt to rid the country of foreign influence. In pandering to this populist sentiment, Sashi had made a massive miscalculation, which had left the country's rulers divided. With lawlessness breaking out and foreign troops poised to take control of the capital, Sashi panicked. She informed the emperor, Wang Shu, that they had to flee. They changed into plain clothes and slipped out of the palace's rear gate.
the city's imperial examination compound, the site of so many a scholar's hopes and dreams, was one of the casualties of the fighting. Returned to the city in January 1901, Sashi finally publicly accepted the need for reform. According to the new decree, reform was to cover the military, law, government, manufacturing, and education. Qing Mu Xin Zheng, 可说是内外交锋下的不得已之举。八国联军攻入北京后，曾只持续是战争祸首，是他招呼易友丹向西方宣战。只有改革旧制，推行新政，不得排外。方可免于追究。正因为如此，慈禧才惊魂普定，发出变法一致。当然，他也是想通过变法让王朝摆脱困境。Education was an important part of the reform package. On August 29th, 1901, an edict. Announced the abolishment of the military examination and the reforming of the civil examination, with the eight-legged essay once again being struck down for the last and final time. The edict also made provision to establish a modern school and college system. September 1902 saw a new semester begin at the Imperial University of Peking. However, attendance was poor, and even those who did come were interested in new knowledge. They were still focusing on preparing for the Imperial examination in the following spring. With such little interest from the students, their professors had to adapt. To attract students to the new courses, the university charged no tuition fees while offering stipends and bursaries. At the same time, it encouraged the students to take the imperial examination while studying new subjects. However, most students still saw the imperial examination as their top priority, with negligible interest in the new courses offered. The university soon faced going bankrupt. 以作为国家人才大典，历代王朝精是专款、专款专用，而学堂是新生事物，政府并无这项预算。清廷在历次战争中屡败，不得不以各地赔款来求和。有计是马关条约、辛州条约后，国库亏空，债贷高筑，无力在学堂办学上再投入资金。一些地方开始挪用科技经费来办学堂，于是有人指出，科技不费，心血不行，科技的存在，阻碍了学堂的发展。
In March 1903, several provincial governors together recommended to the court that the imperial examination be gradually scaled down. They pointed out that without abolishing the imperial examination, scholars would continue to focus on outdated and impractical studies which would do nothing for the country's modernization. However, so many men, having already invested so much time and money in preparing for it, to abolish it overnight would cause unrest. Yuan Shakai, governor of Jili, came up with a solution of gradual reduction. Zheng Jadong, governor of Hu Guang, recommended that the court offer more positions to graduates from the new schools. His advice was heeded, and in 1906, planning started for a new degree system to replace the imperial one. Kujin While China was trying to reform its educational system, its territory was being fought over by two foreign powers. In 1853, Japan's self-enforced isolation was broken by the guns of Commodore Perry's U.S. warships. Thereafter, Japan vigorously embraced modernization in a process called the Meiji Restoration. It established a constitutional monarchy and set about revamping its industry and its military. Within 50 years, it had become the most formidable power in Asia. The 1904 Russo-Japanese War was proof of Japan's new strength. China was powerless to intervene, as the subsequent treaty saw Russia hand former Chinese territory to Japan and the strengthening of Japanese influence in Korea. Once again, Japan's success and the first defeat inflicted on a European power by an Asian one took the rest of the world by surprise. China, it was interpreted by reformers as the victory of a constitutional monarchy over an autocratic imperial dictatorship. The Four metropolitan exams could not be held in the capital because Beijing's examination compound had not been rebuilt after its destruction in the Boxer Rising. 
Instead, the exams were held in the ancient capital of the northern Song, Kaifeng, in Hanan province. Changes had been introduced to make the examinations more relevant to China's contemporary needs, testing the examinee's understanding of world affairs and in solving complex practical issues. After the Metropolitan Exam in Kaifeng, the palace exams were held in the sultry heat of a Beijing July at the Summer Palace. When the chief examiner brought the list of successful candidates, the Empress Dowager was vexed. The first name on the list, the top scoring candidate, was called Zhu Ru Jin. The name bore a similarity to that of the emperor's former favorite, consort Jin. Jin had been a modernizer who had encouraged Feng Shu to stand up to the empress dowager. She had died in mysterious circumstances as the allied powers took control of Beijing in August 1900. It was said that she was responsible. Furthermore, Zhu Ru Jin was from Guangdong. In Sashi's mind, Guangdong was a nest of traitors, having spawned both the reformist leader, Gong Yo Wei, and the revolutionary agitator, Sun Yat sen. He discarded Zhu Ru Jin's paper. Looking through the list, she found another name that pleased her, that of Lu Chun Lin. The name could be taken as Flowing Spring Rain. He came from the Ji Li area around Beijing. Much more suited to her liking, she made him the top candidate. Fangan,普遍流传的一种说法。实际上,当时确定前十本电视卷名字的是光绪,而不是直系。加上清朝科举政治,精神的试卷仍然是密封的。就是光绪机也无法看到坐在的姓名和机关。只有等到名字确定后
Soon and Lu lived many centuries apart, and in that time, the purpose and meaning of the system they submitted to had barely changed. Because of that, for all its high ideals, it had gone from being a beacon to a millstone for the nation's intellectual talent. Kurji 王朝迁入与工具,就像破脏水的时候,把盆里的婴儿也一并倒掉。After the imperial examination system was abolished, modern schooling took off. In 1905, there were just 8,000 new model schools in the whole of China. A year later, that number had tripled, and by 1909, there were almost 60,000. As a modern educational system was gradually being established in China, a new type of intellectual began to appear. Sun Yat-sen spelt the end of China's imperial age. On January 1st, 1912, Sun Yat-sen was installed as interim president of the Republic of China in Nanjing. On February 12th, 1912, an abdication document was signed on behalf of the six-year-old emperor, Hu Yi. The Qing dynasty was consigned to history. Xingzhe 清朝在新开革命中迅速垮台，新兴知识分子的作用不可小觑。Over its 1300-year history. The imperial examination system had produced a raft of great talents in poetry and politics, philosophy and economics. It was the backbone of China's intellectual culture.
The imperial examination system shaped not just China, but influenced many other countries in Asia and the rest of the world. Korea was the first overseas nation to adopt examinations in the 8th century. However, facing the same problems as China, the system was abolished in 1894. Japanese travelers in Tang Dynasty China took much Chinese culture back to their homeland, the imperial examination system included. Vietnam copied the imperial examination system in its entirety, and it was not abolished until 1919, the last country to do so. In the 19th century, Western countries were inspired to adopt their own civil service entry examinations by what they had seen in China. The imperial examination system for all its controversies, corruptions and broken dreams had a profound influence over the history, not just of China, but of the world's civilization.